Well, good morning. As we think about wrong timing, it's interesting. There haven't been a lot of responses online today. That's probably a good thing, or maybe it's, it's an embarrassing thing that we don't want it to admit. But I want to begin this morning talking about that, have you ever noticed that moms generally love to talk about the birth experience of their children? There's something about that experience that never seems to get too old for women. Remembering the first twinges of the contractions, the length and strength of their labor, and the unexpected things they learned about themselves as the intensity increased. And the moment they first held their child. Now that we dads are often there for the delivery, we have our own set of stories. What it was like to be the coach, the moments of quiet panic that was trembling inside of us when the intensity got overwhelming. The feeling of relief when we saw our child and cut the cord. For both mom and dad, there is usually a deep sense that we have just witnessed a miracle. When our first child was born, Nathan, he arrived on Sunday morning. Actually, it was Father's Day, June 15th, 1986. And Jan and I had not made any plans for a guest preacher on that Sunday. We had no plans that Nathan would be born on a Sunday morning, no less. The elders of that church in uh, Beachview gathered the people together for a prayer service of prayer and praise while Jan sang her own songs of delivery. Ahi, ahi, ha, 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 ahu, ahu. Well, you might have a lot of stories about deliverance, deliveries that you've experienced in your life. But we don't have a lot of details about Mary's delivery. Luke, who was a physician himself, only says, while they were there, the time came for Mary to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place or no room for them in the inn. It's not a very detailed part of the Christmas narrative, but the birth of Jesus is still the centerpiece of the story. The time came for Mary to deliver her child. You hear that statement about time? And what do you think? Most of us think it means that Mary reached nine months or full term in her pregnancy. Either way, most of us probably think about the human timing of birth. And from a human perspective, I want to tell you, I think it was a, a lousy timing. Mary must have already been tired and worn out from traveling so far to Bethlehem when she arrived. And she was so far in her pregnancy. She didn't have time to recover from traveling before the birth. One of the most tiring and strenuous experiences was just about to happen in her life. It also was lousy timing to be in Bethlehem when the city was so full of travelers who were coming back to Bethlehem because of the census and the taxation. And there was so many people in Bethlehem, so crowded that they couldn't find shelter probably except in someone's um, manger, someone's place where they were holding 
animals for shelter. The Apostle Paul, though, retells the same simple story of Jesus' birth in his letter to the Galatians. But he adds just a couple more words than Luke. Paul makes the shift from a human story to a God story. And from a narrow sense of time to an eternal perspective. Compare the the two readings. Luke wrote, while they were there, the time came for Mary to deliver her child. Paul wrote, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. The time Paul spoke about was not just the end of Mary's pregnancy. It was the culmination of a promise God had made long before. The promise of a Savior. If I could have tweaked the birth story a little, I probably would have changed the timing of things. I would have let Mary get back home to Nazareth before she gave birth so she could be with her family. Or I would have postponed the census for a couple of months, or at least allowed them to get to Bethlehem in time that they could have found a place in the inn. I probably would have waited until they were married for Jesus' birth to take place. But the truth is, looking at the big picture, God's timing was perfect. Jesus came into the world at just the right moment, at the right time in human history. In the book of Galatians, Paul explains that long before the birth of Jesus, people had turned away from living as the children of God that we were created to be. Like the prodigal son who walked away from his father, Jews and Gentiles alike had orphaned themselves by their sin and rebellion. They became slaves to sin and slaves to the letter of the law. God chose not to rush right in with a Savior until we realized more clearly just how much we needed a Savior. God gave us time to realize that we can't save ourselves by our own efforts or by the law. He gave humanity time to recognize the hunger for freedom and redemption that is deep within each of us. And when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son so that we once again could become children and heirs according to the promise. God worked out all the details, fulfilling all the prophecies about who the Messiah would be, about where and when the birth would take place. That's what God does. He works out the details in all of our lives. Often when the timing seems off to us because God has a bigger sense of timing. The question I asked you at the beginning of the service was, what important event took place in your life that you showed up at the wrong time? Here are some of the responses. Pastor Nisi says, Todd and Christy gave her an invitation to dinner with three grandchildren, and she didn't show up in time, and she writes here, never was invited again. (laughs) 
Chris Jane Skinner writes, I showed up 10 minutes too late for an exam at Penn State. I'm embarrassed why and more embarrassed how I got there close to it on time because it was a seven hour drive and I made it in three and a half hours. Vicki Yoder, at my son's wedding, I was late to be in my seat. All the girls getting ready together were suddenly told we needed to hurry up. My father used to say, Tim, you have two speeds, slow and stop, and you're going to be late for your own funeral. You better work on that. And then I said, Dad, I'm not the one who's going to be late for the funeral. It's whoever's carrying me in is going to make me late. When it comes to God's timing of things, I don't pretend to be able to fully discern, discern or explain God. You know, I like to try. But though there are times I'm sure that I often oversimplify or overcomplicate God and His plan. But I don't try to figure things out expecting to be able to fully explain God. I use the timing of the way that God makes things work as a way to make sure that I keep alert watching, expecting, and celebrating the ways God is active in our world and in our lives. We just had a conversation, Nathan, Jan, and I, the other night, and we were talking about the timing of the Christmas Eve services. I said, let's get through the snowstorm first and see what God has in store for us. I didn't know we were going to get double the amount of snow. But God's timing and his ways are not ours. I also try to figure things out to make sure that I keep God exalted in his place, his proper place, and that I keep myself in my proper place and in my time. You know, the the coach for the Buffalo Bills yesterday was saying, Our mantra is to be hungry, but to be humbled. Pastor Nisi said a couple of weeks ago that the word from the Lord came to her that we ought to be expecting his return soon. But you know, in the moving of events and God's timing, ultimately all of it comes down to a matter of of trust. No matter what happens, when it happens, are we going to trust God in the timing of events in our lives? Elderly Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, had to learn to trust God when he put them in the middle of the salvation story long after they had hoped for and long after they should have been able to bear a child. But they trusted him. Young Mary and Joseph had to learn to trust God when the timing of their baby caused total upheaval in their lives and their culture. Righteous Simeon and Anna the prophetess whom we're going to look at in two weeks, learned to trust God as they waited and they waited and they waited and they waited and they waited year after year after year after year for the promised Messiah. I don't think any of these people understood God's timing any better than you or I do but they trusted. And so we must learn to trust as well. You see, they knew the promises of Scripture that speak about God's good and wise timing in all things. 
They believed the promise of Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you what path to take. You know, as a child, our parents taught us to memorize that verse in the King James. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And my brother, when he had bypass surgery, 45, and we were wheeling him down the hall, he said, Tim, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And when I had my bypass surgery and they were wheeling me down the hall, he said to me, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. As we enter this last week before Christmas, the question of trust is before all of us. Trusting God is more than just believing in God. Trust requires that we go one step deeper than belief. If we believe that God knows exactly what is going on in each of our lives, and if we believe that God is both good and sovereign, trust calls us to surrender to God. And we surrender to God whether you and I are responsible for the bad timing of things in our own lives because of sin or whether we just don't like God's timing. Faith is not just belief in God. It's belief and trust in God. I wish I could see life in this world from God's perspective. The past, the present, and the future. Wish I could see it all at once, like he does. Maybe then I could understand his timing of things. But as it is, we usually only see one screen at a time. Just a small portion of our own story or a tiny fragment of God's big story. And let's be honest, it doesn't always make sense. There are a lot of times I don't like the timing of events and things that have happened in my life at all. I can't tell you why right now there is a global pandemic although I have some thoughts. But I am not sovereign. And I don't have the big picture. I know I couldn't deal with it, even if I did have that power within me. But God can. He is sovereign. He is not confused. He is not limited by space or sin or mortality. And in this season, when we remember we have been giving an amazing glimpse of the big plan, we are invited to trust that plan and God's timing. Even in the midst of of the pandemic, in the midst of whatever is going on in your life that causes you to say, why me? Why now? We are still called to surrender all that we are to him, trusting in his will and his time. One of the devotionals I've been reading through Advent, the author Walter Wengren writes, God has promised and God fulfills. 
Salvation is surely coming to the people of God. And time itself collapses. Amen. Pray with me. Holy and loving God, help us to trust your character. Help us to trust your truth and your love for us. God, right now, I ask that in the quiet of our hearts, we offer up to you the things in our lives that at this point don't make any sense or the timing seems off. Lord, hear our prayers. God, help us where we are having a difficult time trusting you, surrendering to you all that we are, letting go and letting you take hold of us. Help us to believe to the depth of our being, God, that you will care for those things with which we struggle. And that you will care for us in this process. God, we ask that you would help us to surrender. Help us to live in assured reliance on you. On the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. And on the work that Jesus Christ has done for us beginning with his birth, Lord, we thank you for being trustworthy. Keep us mindful and thankful as we celebrate this week, as we prepare to celebrate once again the coming of Jesus Christ into the world as a baby who was born in a manger which seemed to be the wrong time. Even in the midst of all that is going on in our lives, Lord, in the midst of the snow and the pandemic and the uncertainty of life, may we trust you fully. In the name of Jesus, the one who is the Savior and the one who is called Emmanuel, who is God with us in the timing of our lives, we pray these things. Amen.